Oh, hello, everyone. Welcome to Good Tips for Hard Times, where we find smart people who have great advice to help you get through your days. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Anita Sarkeesian. I'm a media critic, public speaker, and the executive director of the Games and Online Harassment Hotline, which is a new emotional support resource for people who make and play games. And I am so excited to announce that the hotline is officially opening on August 3rd, which is like three less than three weeks away. So please follow us on all the social medias. You'll see all of the little icons and names. It's Games Hotline on pretty much everything. Um, so if you follow us, you can help spread the word and get it to the communities and the folks who who need this new exciting resource that I'm excited about. And I'm going to say excited like 20 more times to prove to you how excited I am. <laughs> um, but yeah, we have been working on it for a year. So it's it's been a long time coming. And we're excited about this community that we've built up with you all coming to to check out our show. And so... Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna provide some emotional support for folks, and it's gonna be great, especially uh, with everything that's been going on in the games community right now. We think that these sort of direct support resources are gonna be really important. Speaking of uh, direct support resources, one of the things we wanted to do with this show is start to highlight some of the organizations that um, are within our referral network that are doing um, related work or parallel work to what we're doing that can support folks who are in. Um, in, in, in different kinds of turmoil. And so the Cyber Civil Rights Institute is to institute, not initiative, right? Initiative. <laughs> initiative. That's Marianne on the side there. Um, the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative is um, an organization that I've, um, that does amazing work and I'm so excited to have um, on with us someone from CCRI. So Marianne Franks is a, is a law professor at the University of Miami School of Law, where she teaches First Amendment law, law and technology, and criminal law and procedure. She's the president and legislative and tech policy director of the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative, a nonprofit organization dedicated to combating online discrimination and abuse. She's the author of the first model criminal statute on non-consensual pornography, aka revenge porn. We will talk about terminology around some of that in just a minute. But Marianne, I'm so excited to have you on today. I'm so excited to be here and congratulations <laughs> on you. the games hotline. That's, that's really exciting. Thank you. Um, I've known, I've known you for a long time. We have been in the fire together trying to get social media companies to be better <laughs> for a, for a very long time. Um, and so I've always been a fan of what CCRI is doing. And I think it's, um, I think that as over the years, the work that you've done has been really instrumental in, in helping folks who are, who are suffering from, you know, this particular type of online harassment. So yeah, thanks for being with us and thanks for doing that work. So thank you. And and it's it's good to know that we've been on this for so long because now people will understand why social media has been fixed because we've been working <laughs> on it for a while. I yeah. know. Oh man, that's so oh God. We're gonna be here all night talking about mm. <laughs> talking about our war stories. Um but let's start from let's start from like basics. Um, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about like what like what is revenge porn? I think that there are folks who have heard the term but don't really know what it means or how much it encompasses and also um, why you're not a big fan of that term. Yeah, so revenge porn is the sort of popular term that people use to describe naked pictures of people usually or pictures of them doing some sort of sexual activity. Um, that have been released or distributed in some way that the person who's depicted in them did not consent to. And the reason presumably why it was called revenge porn is because a lot of the early uh, incidences of this kind of behavior um, seem to have been sparked by particularly men who were upset that their girlfriends had left them or had decided to do something that they didn't like. And so it seemed that the release of these photos was very often a form of revenge against that, that uh, partner or ex-partner. One of the many reasons why we don't like the term, although we use it because people do recognize it, is that it sort of falsely indicates a couple of things. And the most important one being that it indicates or suggests that this kind of behavior is limited to partners or ex-partners, and that somehow there's something legitimate, uh, legitimate about the idea of taking revenge on someone who has decided to exercise their autonomy in some way. And so what we have emphasized at the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative is the most important aspect of the behavior, which is that it's non-consensual. And so we generally refer to uh, revenge porn as non-consensual pornography to make that really clear. 
Um, at the same time, we recognize that keeping that term porn is also controversial because it has been pointed out that naked pictures of somebody or people having sex um, and recording it, that's not necessarily pornographic and we shouldn't conflate those terms. The reason why we have retained that particular part of the phrase is because we haven't really come up with any other way to indicate what is being done with these images, which is to put them into the public for sexual gratification. And so when we use the term non-consensual pornography, we're indicating that a person has non-consensually been turned into pornography by becoming um, a spectacle for strangers and people that they did not agree to be exposed to. And so that's why we retain that term, not as a moral judgment about people's uh, naked photos or their videos of sexual acts. Yeah, I think that's really important to emphasize this is too often I feel like there's this blaming the victim mentality of like, well, you shouldn't take the photos in the first place. Um, can you speak to that a little bit, which I'm sure you we hear, hear a lot? <laughs> we hear it a lot because victim blaming, especially when it comes to women and anything to do with sex or nudity is as old as time itself. So um, very often that is something that is you said, I think as a means of trying to trivialize what's happened and as a means of trying to suggest that victims, especially women, can protect themselves simply by not ever engaging in this type of behavior. And our organization strongly rejects that whole framework. The first part of that, of course, is the assumption that there's something inherently wrong or immoral about having naked uh, photos, photos of yourself or engaging in this type of um, you know, use of technology in your sexual life. And we reject any moral judgment about people's consensual decisions about how to use technology and recording devices in their sex lives. But also, as with uh, victim blaming when it comes to domestic violence or with sexual assault, it also just shifts the focus to the wrong person. Um, the problem with non-consensual pornography is not naked images. The problem is non-consensual sexual use of a person. And any time our society responds to sexual abuse by suggesting that the victim is at fault or the victim needs to change her behavior rather than the perpetrator really kind of reinforces the very problem that gives rise to these kinds of abuses to begin with this idea that women's bodies belong to men or that they can be used without their consent and anytime we take the focus off of the perpetrators and what they have done wrong to violate privacy or to violate someone's sexual autonomy we are essentially giving those perpetrators a blank check and allowing our society to continually misunderstand what's really wrong about these kinds of abuses. So our position very much is it's no one's place to judge what a person does sexually so long as they are adult and consenting. What is our place to do is to judge harshly and to discourage and try to prohibit people from using sexuality against them, um, from violating their sexual privacy or taking away their rights to intimate autonomy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, I feel like this is incredibly parallel and a part of rape culture at large, right? That it's about exploiting um, power, right? Power dynamics, being able to control somebody else's um, uh, so, so look, to the the idea of controlling and shaming somebody else is very much what's involved in a lot of um, um, rape culture. And so I feel like this is just yet another tool that is being used as a way to control and shame and silence women um, because it's and it's and it and it works, <laughs> which is the sad thing. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the folks that I've worked with with these sorts of things feel a deep sense of like uh, shame and and anxiety around like oh god is my family gonna see these pictures oh god like who's gonna judge me now because i i made these um and they're mm -hmm. you know they weren't for the world to see right um one thing i was curious about is i imagine that the majority of cases are um like men um releasing photos of ex-partners or women or hacking into women's accounts. Do you find that this is a issue that is sort of beyond gender in some ways? Like, is it, does the, the, the reverse ever happen or nine binary mm -hmm. folks get, um, um, well, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for, like ha mm -hmm. ha report these experiences to you? They do. I mean, it, it is certainly the case um, based on the empirical research that's available so far, including research that was done by the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative, that women are much more likely to be targets um, and men are much more likely to be perpetrators. That being said, there are a number of cases um, where men are the targets um, and where both male and female perpetrators are behind the abuse. And what we've also found in some of our preliminary research is that um, 
there are that they think the group that was considered to be most at risk for non-consensual pornography actually looks to be bisexual women. And we don't know exactly why that's the case, but we know that when it comes to targets, um, we know that people who have um, whose sexual orientation is not heterosexual tend to be a little bit more likely to be victimized, and that women in particular tend to be victimized for that reason, and that gay men and boys are often victimized not only in the sense that their images are being um, released in this kind of violation of privacy, but also as a way sometimes to out them or to shame them or to um, portray them in some sort of negative light because they are not heterosexual. And so the concern that we have um, is not just, is on the one hand, as I'm sure you'll understand, that we should care about this issue, even if it were just exclusively women victims and male perpetrators. That's a good enough reason to care about it. But it actually does affect men too quite often. And it can actually affect anybody. One of the other reasons why victim blaming never works, and, and that's not just the question of whether it's the morally right thing to do, it's also extraordinarily bad advice because almost all victim blaming tries to suggest that there are things a victim can do to avoid becoming a target of this kind of abuse. And that's simply just not the case. Um, as you had mentioned briefly, it's not just a question of someone having voluntary access to someone's photos there are hidden cameras that have produced this kind of material that is then released. There's hacking. Um, people have probably heard about or remember the celebrity hack from a few years ago. The Marines United case, where you've got an entire Facebook group that's dedicated to photos of female Marines that were taken when they were unconscious or had been assaulted. So there is no way to actually protect yourself from this kind of abuse, except to, as a society, condemn this abuse and make sure that the perpetrators are judged and that they are the ones who are punished. On top of all of that, even if you have the fortune of never meeting someone or interacting with someone who would want to betray you this way, and even if you never are the target of a hidden camera or um, of a hacking incident, you may also be deep faked into non-consensual pornography. So someone can manipulate a pornographic image of you so that it looks as though you were engaging in a sexual act. So quite literally, no one is actually safe from the presentation of themselves in a sexual way um, without their consent. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, cool, everything sucks. This is the worst. And also, I'm very familiar personally with all of these things as well. Right. Um, in, right. in like both, th someone tried to make a deep fake of me, but so far, the, this is a total aside, the technology is... Um, still requires an enormous amount of visual data. And so um, it works better on celebrities who have just mm -hmm. hundreds of photos online. So the one that was of me, um, I like had to look really closely and be like, I kind of see how they made that, but it doesn't, mm. like I wouldn't have guessed if it wasn't presented to me as that. Anyways, um, it, it's, it is also terrifying though. I'm not trying to dismiss yeah. the severity of this. I think that some, too often um, those of us who have been targeted uh, have gallows humor when it comes to, to some of these issues, but it can be pretty terrifying and super prevalent. Um, and, and they, they look very real, right? Whether it's photo, Photoshopped images or what have you. And at, at some point that doesn't make a difference whether it is or mm -hmm. isn't real, right? In, in terms of the effects. Right. And one of the things that you just said really, I think underscores what I think we'll probably talk a little bit more about, which is the way that these kinds of abuses are meant to discipline um, women in particular, or really anyone who doesn't fit a certain model of um, sexual behavior or gender roles, right? So um, the more, as you were pointing out, the more available you are or the more high profile you are, that is to say, the more videos there are of you, the more pictures there are of you, the more likely it is that a realistic deep fake of you can be produced. So what does that mean? People who are concerned about being presented in this way have to quite literally censor themselves because they have to worry about whether or not giving this particular presentation or appearing on this particular video call might actually make it easier for someone to target them for this kind of abuse. That's a direct cost to victims or potential victims' freedom of expression. It's a massive imposition of self-censorship. It is something that anyone who actually claims to care about freedom of expression should really care about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do want to talk about free speech, but I before we go into that rabbit hole, um, there was a question in chat, which is great because I was going to go directly into this, um, about loss. So mm -hmm. you you personally and CCRI have been involved in, in writing the first laws around non-consensual pornography and getting them enacted in various states. Can you talk about like what work has been done there, what that looks like right now, at least in the U.S.? 
Yes, um, th there has been a lot of progress, although there's a long way to go. When we started in 2013, and this is when Dr. Holly Jacobs founded the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative and founded it with the express purpose of trying to change law, society, and technology so that no one would be victimized the way that she was. Um, so the, one of the first things we tried to see, because I'm, you know, I was brought on as kind of the law person, was why isn't this illegal already? And in 2013, it was only illegal in three states. And even in those states, it wasn't clearly illegal. It wasn't something that really was obvious to a lot of the members of the general public that this was something you couldn't do. So we set out to change that. And we've, in the time that we have worked on this since 2013, when I wrote the first model um, statute on criminalizing non-consensual pornography, we've gone from three states to 46. And Washington, D.C. also has passed a law. And we have also seen Congress introduce um, so on several occasions now, um, for better or for worse, a federal bill that we helped draft that has not yet been voted on. And so we unfortunately don't have any protections at the federal level. But we do have 46 states that now prohibit some forms of non-consensual pornography. And I can certainly um, talk more about why I think that the vast majority of those laws actually are misguided and aren't protecting victims nearly enough. But there is something to celebrate in the fact that it, we've gone from, um, we've now basically flipped, right, that the number of states that had criminal um, laws against non-consensual pornography being in the minority, we flipped over to it being a minority of states that do not have those protections. That's great, I think. <laughs> uh, just just on the caveat, do you want to talk a little bit more about that caveat you just mentioned about how? Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, so the, the problem has been that one of the things that any a person who's concerned about changing the law or trying to criminalize a particular kind of behavior should care about is making sure we define the crime in the right way. And this goes directly back to the conversation we had about terminology. When people take the term revenge porn very literally, they end up writing laws that say, you can't disclose private sexually explicit images of people with the intent to cause them harm. Now that might sound reasonable because so many of the cases that sort of make their way into public consciousness are those cases we talked about. The angry ex-boyfriend who thinks that this is his way of getting back at the woman who left him. Um, but the problem, of course, is that in many cases, that's not actually why a person discloses these photos. They can have any number of motivations. And in a study that CCRI did um, back in 2018, we found that 79% of the people who did engage in non-consensual pornography didn't do it with the express harm of, in, of uh, with the express intent to harm anyone. What that means is 79% of perpetrators um, don't act in a way that the criminal law can actually reach. So in the vast majority of those 46 states, unfortunately, and due to some very, very misguided views about freedom of speech and due to some very unfortunate, um, how to put this, advocacy, rigorous advocacy on the part of organizations like the ACLU and the EFF, what you've ended up is with is these terrible watered down laws in these states that will only prohibit non-consensual pornography if someone essentially says, I'm doing this to hurt you. Now, that's going to capture some small number of perpetrators, but it's going to leave the vast majority of people who engage in this behavior completely off the hook, including every single revenge porn site operator who will clearly, who will expressly say, right, that they're not engaged in their revenge porn sites trafficking because they hate these women or they want to hurt them. They don't even know them. These women aren't even people to them. So it isn't always a question of intending to harass someone. It's only a question and always a question of someone who's intending to violate the privacy of someone else. That is extremely frustrating. Um, I... I do. I want to. Uh, you brought up the ACLU and the EFF, which are organizations that do really good work and also do really frustrating work at the same time, right? Um, and yes. it, as related to free speech, which is becomes a, very complicated in the online harassment space. Um, before we get into that, though, I do want to like. I want to talk a little bit about what are the tools that people can use um, mm -hmm. to support, to protect themselves right now, or if they find themselves in this position. But but right before we do that, I'm I'm curious. You know, I think that. Um, the sort of questioning the criminal justice system as it stands, questioning mm -hmm. the, um, you know, police and law enforcement and all of that and prisons right now is is a very important topic that I'm glad to see have mm -hmm. mainstream uh, mainstream discussions. Um, so when I think about online harassment laws, um, I've, I've always said it's not the area that I work. I send people to you and other folks in this space that <laughs> work with that. Um, and, you know, one of our colleagues, Danielle Citron, um, talked about how laws can change um, attitudes, 
right? That the mm-hmm. purpose of the laws can change attitudes. But I've heard a lot of stories from folks about the how how taxing and costly and non-supportive the legal route is. So can you? I mean, do you have thoughts around some of that? Like, you know, what it means to do all this work to get these laws in place, but how, like, how effective are they for people? Or like, what does that mean? Yes, and this is one of the most heartbreaking aspects of any legal reform that we have been able to accomplish on this issue, which is that a law by itself does nothing. Um, What you have to have is a criminal justice system or a a system of private justice when it comes to lawsuits and, and civil actions that actually works for the people who are being harmed. And what it means to work for them um, is everything from actually being easy enough for them to understand and not re-traumatizing to actually getting the results that most victims want, which is for the images to be removed and for this person to stop um, abusing them in this way. And unfortunately, um, I mean, we can talk about these separately, the problems with the criminal system and the problems with the civil system, but make no mistake, they're both very broken systems that don't actually serve the interests of justice in most cases. At the same time, precisely as you've mentioned um, Daniel Citron's work on this, there is no way that we can actually get to social reform or real reform on these issues or deterrence of these abuses without engaging the law. So um, I take a very pragmatic approach to legal uh, remedies for these kinds of issues. A person who's become a victim of non-consensual pornography, unlike a person who has been stolen from or someone who's um, been harmed in some other calculable way, right, with money or with the loss of property, a non-consensual pornography victim never gets back what has happened to her. She can never recover truly from what has happened, and there's no way to properly compensate her. And punishment um, of the perpetrator is in itself a question mark, right? Do we want people to be punished for the things that they've done wrong, or do we want there to be some other approach to the law and to legal violations that actually focuses on restoring um, ju- um, restoring victims to where they were, especially when we're talking about crimes that have no real, um, no clear path forward in terms of restitution? The problem uh, for many of us who work in this space is that one of the only ways that you can get people to not engage in bad behavior is by making them afraid of what the consequences are. So as imperfect and unjust as the criminal justice system is, it's also one of the most powerful ways to deter people from engaging in behavior that once they have done it can never actually be undone. So when we asked people in our study a couple of years ago about what, if anything, would have stopped them from doing this, um, from performing this kind of abuse towards another person, the overwhelming response was, if I thought I could go to jail for it. And so we don't want that to be actually the reason why we have these laws. And we don't want mass incarceration to be the solution to the problems that people create for each other. But we also want to deter these kinds of crimes before they happen. So on that pragmatic perspective, we at the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative have put a lot of emphasis on the criminalization of non-consensual pornography, not because we want people to go to jail for long sentences, but because we want them to not engage in this behavior at all. And that seems to be the most effective way of trying to communicate that message. Yeah, that's complicated. (laughs) Yeah, that's very complicated. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, Thank you for clarifying that. I think that's really useful to understand. Um, So what so um, what are things people can do? You have a helpline, which I think is amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you tell us a bit about that? Yes. So the helpline is 24 hours and I can tell people I don't have it memorized, but 844-878-CCRI is the number that you can call if you have discovered that you are a victim of non-consensual pornography and the people on the helpline are there to try to help you walk through that moment of crisis. And our website, um, cybercivilrights.org, has a lot of resources on it that allow people to think carefully about what the next steps are that work for them. Because exactly as we were saying before, calling the police or starting a lawsuit is either not feasible or just not desirable in lots of cases. And so what we want to do at CCRI is provide as many Um, sort of self-help remedies as possible. And that includes a really extensive guide that we've developed with the major social media platforms and how to report this kind of behavior and how to try to get the images or the videos taken down. And so we recommend that people who are, for whom that is the real priority, have a look at our resource guides in in terms of content removal and um, talk to someone at the helpline in case they need other kinds of help. And then consider too, our attorney resources page, which um, allows people to um, at least talk to some attorneys in their jurisdiction about whether they're thinking about litigation. 
and or think about copyright remedies, um, other ways that there are to try to remove this kind of material based on um, essentially what is a claim of ownership over the videos or photos. This is an option that works for some individuals, although of course, if the image has been taken by someone other than the victim, then it's not actually a path that they can go down. Right, right. Um, I feel like, not to be uh, too pessimistic, I, I get a lot of people who reach out to me about being doxxed, which is the distribution mm -hmm. of private information online. And I, I hate, it's so frustrating because I'm always like, it's hard to put it back in. Like you can't, once it's out there, that's that's it. And so I really encourage folks to take, um, even if you don't think that you're going to be targeted, because I don't think anyone really mm -hmm. thinks that they're ever going to be targeted necessarily, um, to take whatever precautions you can ahead of time. And that's not to like not do those activities or not take those pictures, but think about like where they're being stored maybe or, or mm -hmm. those sorts of things. And same with, with doxing, um, you know, like I think, it is shocking how much of our private information is actually not private and is online. And there are steps you can take um, to try and remove some of that private information before it gets out there. Yeah. Um, let's talk about free speech. <laughs> I feel like sure. so you have a book called the cult of uh, the cult of the constitution, which I think is the best title ever. Um, oh, our deadly devotion to guns and free speech. And I think that free speech, you know, it, you, you alluded to this earlier around like why some of these laws have been gutted. I hear, you know, free speech being bandied around a lot when talking about issues around online harassment, when we're trying to support and protect folks online. Um, so mm -hmm. can you, can you do your thing? <laughs> do the thing where you explain it. Well, where to start, right? Yeah. So the first thing that I think is really important to, to get our minds around is when um, powerful members of society are willing to characterize a certain form of conduct as speech and when they're not. And if we think, for instance, about the extraordinary work that the ACLU and the EFF and others have done on, let's say, um, surveillance and tracking and facial recognition technology, you'll notice something interesting. When the ACLU fights against the expansion of surveillance, when it fights against facial recognition technology, it does so on the grounds that these kinds of invasions into a person's um, privacy are simply illegitimate and that they will harm democracy, that they chill freedom of expression, that they are bad for all of us. The extraordinary thing is, is that if you're going to say that about the use of the technology that recognizes your face when you're out in public, why would those same organizations think about a very similar type of privacy violation, which is intimate private photos that were not even um, taken in public and have those be used in nefarious ways? Why would the ACLU and the EFF and other civil libertarians suddenly call that speech? In other words, why is there a segment of society that will look at facial recognition technology and surveillance technology and say, well, that's clearly not speech, that's an invasion of privacy and it chills freedom of expression. But when it comes to non-consensual pornography, say, no, actually that's freedom of expression, it's not a violation of privacy. My thesis about this is the same that, you know, and this will come as no surprise to you, is that like so much of the really bad, hypocritical, stupid things that exist in our society, this is due to misogyny. The reason why these groups treat these kinds of things differently is because one of them disproportionately affects women and is directly related to certain sexual stereotypes and sexual behaviors, and the other one isn't. That is, certain civil libertarians will consider something to be privacy violating as opposed to freedom of expression because it might affect them, whereas other types of the same, even more invasive ways of invading someone's privacy will suddenly be characterized as free speech because there's a group of people that will never have to worry or doesn't think that it ever has to worry about becoming the targets of it. And I think that that is one of the most shameful and truly obscene things that civil libertarian societies and organizations have done is to have that kind of double standard and be quite shameless about it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, that, I, I, yes, I, I don't have a good response to that because it was perfectly explained. Um, and I, I find it extremely frustrating. And I think about it a lot in terms of um, you, there's a couple of things. One is that our laws don't recognize power. Um, necessarily. They're not baked into that. And, and I think that that's a, a real oversight in terms of understanding like who is at most risk, right? And who needs most support mm -hmm. and that these organizations um, and the people who sort of tout free speech as the end all be all of everything, uh, whether it's related or not, really don't acknowledge how power is being exploited and used in a lot of these spaces. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I think a, another piece of this is 
social media companies and the platforms in which these uh, images proliferate and, you know, even a, a larger scale around online harassment, um, very early days and still today there is a defense of free speech on these privately mm -hmm. held platforms. Uh, and I think you and I both have struggled a lot with trying to mm -hmm. illuminate that, like, but you're not a state, <laughs> like mm -hmm. you, you're not held to that same, you can, you can hold yourself to your own standards. And so what do you, mm -hmm. you know, what do these companies really stand for? Right. Right. Yes. And a huge part of my book is about trying to figure out the impulses to make things into constitutional issues that are not. And, and what you just described is, is one of the sort of classic examples of this. The number of times people will bring up the First Amendment or constitutional rights or freedom of speech when the issue or the activity in question has nothing to do with any of those things is astounding. And the entire reason why my book is called The Cult of the Constitution and why I refer to um, th this kind of irrationality as constitutional fundamentalism is because it so closely tracks religious fundamentalism that um, in the sense that we're talking about no one who presents themselves as a defender of the First Amendment or the Constitution or free speech absolutist is ever any of those things. What they are is somebody who wants to take an important influential text, read it incredibly selectively and deploy it against the people who um, are most vulnerable to abuse. And so exactly as I was saying with the ACLU or the EFF, perfectly willing to recognize that those aren't First Amendment issues, that it is perfectly acceptable for private entities to make their own rules about what they're going to allow on platforms and what kinds of speech they are going to support, what kind of speech they're going to promote. But suddenly the very same people who are invested in other kinds of speech or don't see how harmful they are will suddenly be really um, um, sloppy about pointing out that this is not a First Amendment issue, that these are not actually constitutional rights at all. So that move that people make to try to turn things into a constitutional argument when they aren't is essentially a kind of selective um, on and off switch, right? Which says that sometimes I think this is a matter of constitutional significance and sometimes I don't. And to oversimplify myself a bit in the book, I'm arguing that most of those invocations of constitutional values are really nothing more than self-interest. The real question for most people is, I'm gonna call it the First Amendment or the Second Amendment or whatever it is when I care about it. And anytime that I don't care about it, I'm going to say that it's not a matter of the Constitution at all. So exactly as you're saying, there is a complete um, disregard for the way that power plays into all of this. There's a complete disregard for the fact that what we want from private entities is quality control. And what we want from them is editorial control. We don't want to step into chaos every time we are on a social media platform. Nobody actually wants that. What people seem to not understand is that um, every single social media platform that has been touting itself as a free speech zone from the very beginning has always had rules, always had rules around spam, always had rules around permissible behavior on the platform, always had rules about duplicate usernames, et cetera. And no one calls those things censorship. So it is always a matter of asking if a person is going to suddenly get very agitated about freedom of speech or constitutional values to ask what is it that they're trying to protect and who is it that they're trying to ignore? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, there is a question in chat that I think is related mm -hmm. to some of this. Um, are major platforms responsive to taking down the images or videos? Are major porn sites, social media sites, um, for example, like, are they doing the work? Like, are they responsive to? <laughs> yes, there, take your time. There's a... <laughs> I always think about, you know, those awards that they sometimes give out in schools for most improved. And I, I think about that because, you know, the beginning point for so many of these platforms was to completely ignore non-consensual pornography as a plot problem. They wouldn't even talk about it. But the response we always got was, it's freedom of speech. We can't do anything about it. That was the, the party line from basically every major tech leader. And so starting around 2015, that changed, at least in policy. And that was a huge thing because names matter, right? Policies matter, even if they may not be perfectly executed. So I'll say this, post-2015, um, after advocacy by organizations like ours, the responsible, I should take that back, the major tech platforms have all had policy um, changes against non-consensual pornography and have put certain systems into place for reporting and takedowns. Now, in terms of how well that's working, how responsive they are, um, what, how many hoops they make a victim jump through, whether or not they genuinely try to um, prevent non-consensual pornography and other antisocial behaviors, 
in their design as opposed to pushing off the burden onto victims to get victimized first and then have to go through the process of trying to undo it. Well, the, one of the problems is that we don't get their data, right? We don't, every time a social media platform says, we've now got this policy, we've got a great procedure in place, our next question is, well, show us how it works, right? So how many complaints do you get? And how do you decide which ones to action and which ones not to? Without that information, we can't really evaluate how well any of these companies are actually doing. We're very um, happy about the fact that they are now taking our calls and that there is at least some formal space for us to discuss why NCP is a problem. But I think at this stage, what we are asking of all of these platforms is give us the data, tell us what you're doing, not only um, in terms of complaints and whether or not you're being transparent and whether you're being um, uh, fair and all of this, but also tell us what you're doing to try to prevent this from happening to begin with. Because it is no time in 2020 for any social media platform or tech company to say, oh, this problem, we didn't really know about it. We didn't expect it to happen. We're not sure what to do. You know, right? Um, and if you're still producing policies and platforms and tools that you, you, the CEO or whoever makes these decisions hasn't thought about in terms of what will the worst person in the world do with this tool, then you are acting irresponsibly and you shouldn't be in your job. Um, everyone who is making decisions about these powerful tools that all of us rely on needs to be thinking about the ways that it's going to affect vulnerable populations. That needs to be part of their job description. So that's what we're looking for from all tech companies. And I wouldn't be able to say that any of them have actually fulfilled that yet. Yeah. Uh, I, I sort of chuckled to myself a little bit when you were talking about transparency because <laughs> like tech companies notoriously aren't like you have to sign your life away just to walk in those doors. Um, or to even have a conversation with them half the time. And so there's such a fear um, around discussing these issues publicly, acknowledging that the, it's a problem, talking about how they're solving the problem, um, instead of being more, they, they think of it as like proprietary, as mm -hmm. opposed to what I would encourage all of them to start thinking about is like how they can share what they're finding with each other so that we can create a much safer ecosystem, not like, it's not like anyone is rushing to solve this problem and be the first one to solve the problem and therefore they're the best platform. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it, I, fi I find it very frustrating that this mm -hmm. constant uphill battle of like, why are you being so secretive about this? Like, why can't, and, and is it because you're not doing anything? Mm. Because if you don't talk to us about what you're doing, we're going to assume that you're not doing anything. Um, which right. may or may not be true, and they might be doing the wrong things. Yeah, anyways, mm -hmm. I, I don't know why I'm ranting about this, but <laughs> I feel no, like... No, this is exactly relevant to the, the, the point, because it, this is the right question to ask, right? How, how well are they doing after they've made these commitments? And none of us have the answers to that, because we don't know what they're doing. And again, if we're ever going to get systems and tools um, and products that don't repeat and encourage people to act in incredibly destructive ways, then we're just going to be stuck in this bad... Um, status quo forever. Yeah. And I think to be to be fair a little bit that the different social media companies have different policies around transparency. So, um, you know, one of the things that that happens is if you're willing to be transparent about it, you're going to make mistakes publicly. And it's mm -hmm. hard to do that on a platform of millions of people. And then you get like yeah. raked through the coals. But I think that like the the institutional pride needs to be sucked up and realize that that's how process works in a space where we don't mm -hmm. actually know the answers and we have to we have to test it whereas other companies are will not talk to outsiders or will not share mm -hmm. what changes are happening on the platform at all mm -hmm. and there's lots happening uh, but we don't ever know about it the users don't ever know about it no and I, I just to add to that point I do find it very frustrating when you've got companies that are willing to try to be transparent. And then the next thing you see is that because they have either made a mistake or because they have not fully uh, worked through all the implications of their policy, the media and the public freaks out and says, well, look, you took down this thing that you clearly shouldn't have taken down. And there's just such an eagerness, as you say, to rake over the coals. When we, when we, If you're talking about any of these companies trying to implement responsible policies at this stage at scale, there are going to be mistakes and not even just mistakes. None of us should be arrogant enough to think that we know how any of this should work. If, if the way that we have sort of um, assumed things should work is kind of vaguely quasi legal, right? Imagine that, you know, if we just look at the Supreme Court decisions for one term, how confusing that is and how debatable it is and how people can disagree about whether they get the right, um, they've struck the right balance. Think about the ways that laws get made or implemented or, <clears throat> or are actually acted on. 
it's complicated. And so what I do hate to see is that when you do have a company trying to make these kinds of efforts, the, 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 the sort of ferocity with which people are going to say, but look at this one anecdote here about how bad that makes you look. That is not the right way to try to encourage this, this um, kind of behavior. With that being said, these are mostly companies that are totally happy to say, hey, we're the rebels and we're taking risks and we're the innovators. They do need to be able to suck it up a little bit and say, yeah, the public's going to come down hard on you and that's okay. Just tune it out, right? Because you're supposed to be the innovators. You're supposed to be the people who are going to take risks and make people unhappy. You ought to be able to deal with that and it shouldn't throw you off your game. Yeah, absolutely. <sighs> if only people listen to us. <laughs> um, what can... Like, do you, I, you know, I hate this question and I'm about to ask you it. So feel free to just be like, no, but I feel like there are a lot of folks who are really frustrated, right? Who are just sort of like average users on platforms who like don't want the world to be this way and, and feel helpless. Um, they, there might be bystanders watching this happen to other people. Like, are there ways that they can get involved in activism around trying to, confront some of this, challenge social media companies, try to push forward um, legal changes and that sort of thing? I think the answer is yes. And I, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the frustration because I feel it every day too. Um, but public pressure does work sometimes. And we're seeing it right now with Facebook um, in terms of it's the you know, the most recent campaign to try to push on advertisers to, to drop, you know, Facebook or to drop their advertising um, efforts on Facebook so long as Facebook has these terrible policies in place. Um, and this isn't the first time that that's happened. One of the ironic things, I guess, about watching this cycle is that you know, we've seen it before, right? One of the first things that, um, you know, one of the first efforts at reform that actually worked um, and was a, um, a great model for reform was the feminists who actually organized around Facebook against their um, the rape uh, pages that they were promoting, the misogyny that was there. Soraya Chamali and others who figured out that their best way to try to talk to Facebook was through the advertisers. And that does seem to be a pretty robust strategy. But I would have to say, I think the advertising strategy works because we have this completely dysfunctional way of dealing with social media. There shouldn't be um, a profit model for these social media companies that's dependent on advertisers because this is what worries me about these campaigns is that they fade and Facebook will ride them out as it always does and the pressure will go away and the advertisers will come back and we'll be stuck with the same problem. I think if we really care about the dysfunction of our platforms, we have to be willing to do some serious structural changes. And that can include things like reforming Section 230, which is a whole um, you know, bed of wasps, um, but or also just trying to push for some sort of actual structural change that makes it so that these social media companies cannot pretend to be offering us free services. The entire model of give me a free service while I extract all of your data and make your life miserable is not one that I think is sustainable and it really is something we should all be rethinking. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I And I agree. I think the public pressure is what has created so much change over the years and not that we're at any kind of utopian solution, but just in the time, in the decade that I've been doing this work, I've seen a huge shift in the public consciousness around these issues where, you know, I remember talking to folks at Twitter where the safety team was like four people and all they cared about was spam. Yeah. Like, and they, they were yes. like, we don't do anything on content to today. We're like, whatever, we're talking about Twitter is a whole issue, but you know, there is a, um, they have a whole safety committee, right? They are, right. they are doing some work to try and deal with this, which is a huge difference. And the reason that that happened is because People got raked through the coals in the media because the public started speaking up because issues around online harassment were starting to become impossible to ignore mm -hmm. as more and more people were experiencing it and and, and publicly talking about it. And so um, I, I just want to reiterate and echo that, like, we need to keep putting pressure on mm -hmm. on these companies and we need to keep putting pressure on the social cultural change that needs to happen for, you know, we need people to stop being terrible, <laughs> but in the yes. meantime, we need to we need the tools that al and al enable them to be terrible to make it harder for that behavior to continue. So, yes, I think that's exactly right. And these things are all connected. There's, we don't, you know, we get the kinds of behaviors that we get because the way that incentives work online do this, right? I mean, if your bottom line is engagement, if your bottom line is getting eyeballs and getting clicks, you're going to have dysfunctional behavior. You're going to get antisocial behavior. So we can't, you know, as, as responsible members of the public, we also have to take responsibility for what we're doing, right? You know, what is it that we're trying to reward? What is it we want to reward? What is it we want to encourage? 
And my very pessimistic take on social media generally and on internet technology generally is that it's all the wrong values, all the wrong values that get rewarded for immediacy and impulsivity and taking the most superficial and ungenerous um, perspective of complex issues. All of that is pushing us in the wrong direction and it's making all of us um, into little psychopaths. <laughs> yeah, it is. That's so, that's so cute and sad. <laughs> Um, Marianne, thank you so much for this conversation and joining us today. I think that these are really important issues that are very hard to untangle. And I've always admired your ability to speak so clearly um, about the, about this so that folks can start to understand the nuance and the complicatedness of some of this. Well, thank you for having me. And it's lovely to see you as always. You too. Um, where can folks find out more about CCRI? How can they get your book? I'll say that uh, we have linked your book in the chat and, um, oh, and we will link it in the YouTube video as well. It's called The Cult of the Constitution. Go check it out if you care about these issues. Um, but yes, please, please answer the question that I just answered for you. Oh, no. So thanks. Uh, the Cult of the Constitution is available. You know, you can get it directly from the publisher site, which is Stanford Press. Um, or you can go to bookshop.org, which is one of my new favorite places. Or, of course, you can go to Amazon um, do and <laughs> shaking your head. No. Um, and the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative page um, for resources and more information about what we do, including ways that you can get involved or ways that you can donate. That's cybersolrights.org. Nice. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. We will talk to you soon. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. Uh, thanks, everyone, for hanging out and being a part of that conversation with us. Um, thanks to our mods for keeping this space friendly. And, you know, you can watch this video or any of our videos at any time at our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash games hotline we also actually have a new site up um at gameshotline.org slash good tips that shows you the schedule of the upcoming uh episodes and also links to all of the the archive of the previous episodes so please check that out it's also pretty so go look at it and tell me that you think it's pretty <laughs> um the games hotline is a free resource we are launching august 3rd if you want to help us keep it that way please head over to gameshotline.org slash donate and share a few bucks if you can ccri is also also a nonprofit and they could use funds to continue doing their work so please uh, do a little tip jarring for them as well if you have the resources to do that um, you can join me next week when we talk to Dave Snell about creative ways to play tabletop role-playing games online during a time when folks aren't able to meet in person so we'll see you all next week bye